The best way to fail at any game development is to never try, but one could argue that if you never try, you'll never fail. So let's assume you do try. Here's how to fail. So out of all the genres and styles of games that exist, you decide you want to make a horror game because you're one of those game devs. You can read into that however you want. Anyway, horror games are not too difficult. All you gotta do is make a walking simulator, and then with a bit of careful planning, you can just add a bunch of jump scares. Because surprise equals fear. These words are synonymous. Extra points if you can make the audio during these jump scares blow out the player's eardrums. When making horror games, always remember, you are the game dev, and you know what's best to scare the player. The individual player doesn't know. Their imagination isn't the strongest and most powerful thing to scare them. What do they know? They are just soulless consumers of the games you're going to make. Probably. So obviously the best way to scare them is by explaining and showing everything to them. Especially the threat in your game. Just show them the monster. I mean, you probably spent at least a few minutes drawing or modeling it, so someone ought to appreciate it. And this way, they can understand exactly how scary it is. Alternatively, you could just drop the player off somewhere, without any context or why they are there. It could be a rickety old house, an orphanage, a hospital, or a doorway into a fiendish hellscape. Doesn't really matter. The idea here is to just confuse the player completely. You do have to be careful though, because if you accidentally give the player some context without giving quite enough information to satisfy their curiosity, then their minds might start to wander and dream up what horrible threat might be lurking, and the player's slight grasp of the unknown could cripple them with paralyzing fear made up in their own minds. But don't worry. Remember, players don't have imaginations. But even if you did accidentally give just enough context to hit that sweet spot, and trigger an overactive imagination, all you gotta do is revert back to plan A and just explain and show 100% of everything, just to be safe. Or you could just... <laughs> If you do try to hit that sweet spot of mystery, a good way to do this is to just make everything really, really dark. That way the player doesn't really know where the monster is, or, or where the end of the level is, or where the MacGuffin they've been instructed to find is. Seeing things is overrated. I mean, check this out. This whole time I've been talking, I animated a sequence showing a first-person view of someone running around in a haunted cathedral with a scary werewolf statue trying to kill them with poison lollipops. Pretty great, huh? Alright, time to talk about stakes. I like mine medium rare, and a lot of it. And the same thing goes for scary games. There should be a lot of stakes, but this is rare. So if you want to fail, keep it rare. In fact, don't include any stakes at all. Anytime the player makes a mistake in your game, especially if your horror game is linear, just reset the player about 20 seconds back so they can decide to turn left instead of right. I mean, really long systems of boring trial and error is actually pretty scary if you think about it. If you were to give the player something important to do or care about, or some type of greater motivation to continue other than just holding down W, it would mean greater loss than just a few minutes of time and might actually instill a sense of worry deeper than the fragile narrative you've slapped on out of necessity. But come on, that'd be a successful way to do things. So the more you can make your game like one of those lame rides that just move through a dark hallway with zombie puppets that pop up sometimes, the better. And in order to maximize the scariness of your game, don't let any part of your game not be scary. I mean, it only makes sense. Like, adding a safe spot for a peaceful moment to relax is just time spent not scaring the player. Don't believe anyone who tells you otherwise. The lies they might tell you is that perhaps by giving the player a breather, will build up anticipation and dread for when they get back into the scary parts, increasing the overall scariness. Or that by having a game that's non-stop scary all the time could desensitize the player, making the game boring over time. But none of that's true, because we know the psychology of fear is simple, and doesn't take complex planning and mental manipulation to pull off. So if you do add any peaceful, safe moments, then it should only be there to lull the player into a false sense of security so that you can... In the end, if none of this works, you can always just make a Five Nights at Freddy's clone. The original FNAF was successful because it took the principles of horror game design and applied them, and did it in a fun, unique way. But that takes creativity and actual effort. It's much easier to just make cheap, blatant copies of successful games, but of course, yours will be better. Oh, and also don't forget about... And if you follow these instructions carefully, you are bound to succeed at failure. Hey, hey you, hi. Thanks for watching. I know you're no dummy, so you probably think I'm gonna try to pull another jump scare at the end of this, but please, I'm not that predictable. I only get about 20 seconds for this end screen anyway, so obviously I made some plans this time around, and if there's enough time, I was gonna show you something that, in my opinion, is really kinda cool, and without a doubt, one of the greatest